Hello, everyone. My name is Sherry Lynn Phelps, and I am the Agronomy Manager with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, and we'll be moderating this webinar today. We also have Andrea Lauder, our Communications Manager. We both welcome you to our fourth Pulse webinar for 2020. Bit of administration before we get started. To get CCA credits for today's webinar, you must be watching it live. Andrea will send out an email after the webinar requesting your CCA number, and if more than one person is watching, you will need someone to verify those in attendance. The webinar will be recorded and posted to our website for future viewing for those unable to attend or for those who want another look at what was addressed. For today's webinar, all participants will be muted. We will be happy to take questions at any time during the presentation. And to ask the questions, just type it into the question box that is located in the GoToWebinar dashboard. For today's webinar, all, we will hold all questions to the end of the presentation where they will be addressed. Today's speaker is Greg Bartley with Pulse Canada. Greg was raised on a small grain farm near Roland, Manitoba, growing wheat, canola, and soybeans. He holds a Master's and Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from the University of Manitoba. Before starting his position with Pulse Canada, he worked at the Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers, coordinating their on-farm network research program which is a network of farmers across Manitoba that conducts small or on-farm research in pulse and soybean crops. As the Director of Crop Protection and Crop Quality at Pulse Canada, Greg works to ensure the Canadian pulse industry benefits from new crop protection products, minor use registrations, affordable and accessible products, and adoption of import tolerances for crop protection products in the global marketplace. I will now turn the presentation over to Greg for the webinar titled, making sure to keep it clean. How can you protect market access for pulses? Great, thanks Sherry Lynn. And uh, thanks all for, for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking some time, whether you're, you're, you're seating right now, or if you, you're at home uh, during this uh, unprecedented times right now. So as I mentioned, my name is Greg Bartley. I'm the Director of Crop Protection and Crop Quality at Pulse Canada. And I've, I've joined this position for just over a year now. So I'm really excited to, to, to present to you today through a webinar and um, talk about market access issues uh, affecting Canadian pulses, specifically around the use of crop protection products and their associated MRLs. So just to give a bit of a background or an overview of who we are at Pulse Canada. Uh, Pulse Canada is, is a national commodity association that represents the growers and trade of the Pulse value chain. Our members are consist of the Ontario Bean Growers, the Alberta Pulse Growers, Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers, and Saskatchewan Pulse Growers. We, all, we also represent the, the members of the trade through the Canadian Special Crops Association, therefore representing the full value chain. Through our partners, we're able to leverage some of our funding uh, through the federal uh, agriculture program uh, to, to get funding through, through the CAP program for, for program-based funding. At Pulse Canada, our, our main mission is to contribute to the profitability of Canadian pulse industry. We're able to do this through, through two avenues, uh, broken into two different teams. Of this, uh, we work through the corporate affairs team, and our goal is to lower the costs associated with the transportation and marketing of pulses. We do this through uh, our collaboration through the Egg Transport Coalition, uh, reduce barriers to market access, and also uh, work to make sure that our crop, res or crop protection products don't create a, create a trade bar barrier through the use of crop protection products. As well, uh, we also work at Pulse Canada, known as our market innovation team. This team works to build new and sustainable demand for Canadian pulses. Right now, our current strategy is, is something that we like to call the 25 by 2025. Through this, our target is to increase the uh, new demand and new use categories uh, for our pulse crops uh, for 25% of our production into by the year 2025 into new use and new demand. So to give a brief overview of the global pulse industry and where Canada fits, um, i first like to talk about uh, as far as to, uh, crop, pulse crop producers and where Canada fits in there. So global pulse production, uh, by far, India is the greatest pulse producing country in the world. However, Canada is close second, producing about 10% of, of the pulse production for, for the global demand. If you compare this to, to pulse exports, however, Canada is by far the leader in pulse exports to the global demand. Canada supplies about 33% of the pulse production or pulse demand in the global marketplace. So 
If we break down our top 10 pulse exports in 2019, we can see that over 60% of our pulse production was exported to over just to three countries, China, Bangladesh, and India. However, what I want to highlight here is that 85% of our pulses grown in Canada are exported, and we export our pulses to over 120 different countries. It's safe to say that Canada is very dependent on, on exports within their pulse industry, and maintaining market access to different countries is really important to the sustainability of our pulse industry. However, we're entering what we like to call an era, an era of uncertainty. We are seeing an increase in tariff-free and reduced access. Canada has done a really good job of, of signing trade agreements. In fact, Canada is the only G7 country to have a trade agreement with every other G7 country. This is really good work by, by our, our government to establish these trade agreements, especially with all of our other countries. However, what we are seeing is an increase in non-tariff trade barriers. A recent stat from 2019 is that since 2017, protectionist measures disguised as technical and regulatory requirements have seen a six-fold increase. We, there are many examples that, that can be shown for this in the increase in non-tariff trade barriers. Something close to our hearts is, is our pulses in India. However, we can also look at canola into China, Dermot into Italy, and uh, many other issues that, that come to mind of these non-tariff trade barriers. Of these non-tariff trade barriers, sanitary and phytosanitary uh, non-tariff measures are the bulk of the issues. Within the sanitary and phytosanitary tariff measures, crop protection products and associated MRLs, or maximum residue limits, make up a large proportion of this. So what's the issue? Well, Canada's exports must meet the needs of our customers, and the problem is they're not always the same as the Canadian regulations. Canada's reputation as a safe and reliable supplier, supplier of, of crops is valuable to us, and we must continue to meet the needs of our customers to keep this reputation. Customers have their own requirements. So this is, customers' requirements are becoming a lot more complex. Like Canada, other countries regulate this food to protect plant, animal, human, and environmental health. With these aspects, Close attention is required for pesticides in the residues, seed technology, such as biotechnology, and plant diseases like black leg and fusarium other crops. These are all known issues that have the potential to create a market access issue into different countries. And again, we need to pay close attention to these issues. However, for today's presentation, I'm really gonna focus in on that pesticides in the residues. So before I move on too far into to some of the issues and what we're doing, I want to take a moment to, to kind of define what an MRL is or maximum residue limit, as it does make up a bulk of, of the information in this presentation. So an MRL, MRL stands for maximum residue limit. An MRL represents the maximum amount of pesticides, pesticide residues, that are expected to remain on a food product when the pesticide is used according to label directions. I want to repeat that last part when the pesticide is used according to label directions. That is the key component of the MRL definition that everyone needs to keep in mind. An MRL is not a measure of food safety. It's used primarily for trade purposes. So just to highlight the, the difference here and what we see that an MRL is not a food safety issue, we have a chart on the slide here that indicates where an MRL fits as far as the toxicology and food safety aspect in relation to, to the risk to human health. So within toxicology, there's a few different levels that, that are used to describe the risk uh, to human health. If you look on the y-axis, this is the increased exposure to, to a pesticide residue. And as it increases, our risk to human health increases. So on this, on this chart, we can see there's something called the no observed adverse effect level. So if your exposure to pesticide levels is, in, is above this level, it means there's a human health concern. You know, there's a media concern, it's, it's, it's a human health concern. If, it was, if residues were to be above this level, you know, it's not safe for human health. The other kind of key point on this toxicology figure is something called the ADI or acceptable daily intake. Between the ADI and the no observed adverse effect level is kind of a gray area. It runs on a case-by-case -case scenario, whether it's going to create a human health concern or not, due to factors such as um, gender, weight, exposure, things like that. However, 
if you look at the, the low of the acceptable daily intake level, so the level that's, that's available to ingest it daily over a period of time and not create a human health concern, we probably have the MRL. And in many cases, the MRL is set 100 times lower than the successful daily intake level. So again, an MRL is not a measure of food safety, it's just an indication that is used according to label directions. And one thing that's key to point out here is that Canadian crops must meet the MRLs set by the destination country in order to avoid trade disruptions, not just the MRLs in Canada. So why does this matter? Well, what we're seeing is that the trading environment is shifting. What we're seeing is that there's more missing MRLs as fewer countries are using international standards such as Codex. I just want to take some time to describe the figure on the screen. There's many different scenarios for, for MRL lists associated with a different country. Like Canada, we have our own national list of MRLs. We consider this a national MRL list. In this case, we, we define our own list associated with the MRLs and we do not defer to any other country's MRL list. Again, there are many other countries that do much the same. If you look at the another standard, Codex or Codex Recommended, this is where we, we say it's an international standard. So Codex is a body that establishes MRLs and they can, it's, it's meant to be the international standards that other countries can refer to in the case that they don't uh, have an MRL list, or maybe they might defer to this list in the absence of a, their own national list. So that's another option for, for countries to defer to is Codex, now, another option is for a country to have their own national list, so where they establish their own national MRL list. But again, if they don't have an MRL list, they could defer to this codex or this international standard in the case that there's a missing MRL. This is a good thing, as in many cases, we do see missing MRLs within national lists, and this codex list provides that opportunity to put a MRL in place in the absence of that MRL. Another option is what we call the EU deferral or EU list. This is something that's similar to a national list, but all the EU countries or like-minded countries refer to this EU list. So it's considered, I would consider it more like a national list, but there's many countries that defer to this. And then there's some other odds and ends uh, for countries that dispose of the national list. So what I wanna highlight here is that if you look at this chart and you can see the amount of countries that defer to their own list, such as EU or their national list or some type of other, so deferring only to a single list, is the majority of the cases. There's only a small proportion that looks at a, have their own national list and defer to some type of international standard that might create harmonization. This is a challenge because as I mentioned, more missing MRLs is fewer countries are using the international standards. So if they have a national list, they don't have an MRL, then in that case, there'll be a non-compliance in the case that an, uh, an MRL is exceeded. Another thing we're seeing in the trading environment is that residue testing is more sensitive. MRLs are usually represented in what we call a PPM or parts per million. In some cases, residue testing become more sensitive that we're able to test down to the parts per billion, PB, PBB, or parts per trillion level. These are really small, minute amounts. For example, a per one part per billion is equal to about nine canola seeds in a Super B trailer. If you look at one second or one uh, part per trillion, that's equivalent to about one second in about 32 years extremely small amounts that are able to be tested now. We're at the point where essentially we can find anything on anything. Another thing that's happening in the trading environment is there's heightened monitoring and testing of residues. For example, it's becoming much more cheaper to test. The equipment is becoming more available, again, cheaper. So what we're seeing is that countries that typically wouldn't have tested or don't, you know, wasn't a priority in the past, we're now seeing them move to more testing as it becomes more available. An example of this is, is India, where they, they notified that uh, about two years ago, where they typically did not test, that they would begin to start testing for glyphosate residues in, the, in their imported uh, crops. Again, that's a risk that we need to be aware about and the trading environment is shifting. Another key thing that's happening right now is the differentiation between hazard-based versus risk-based MRLs. This is something that we're paying closely attention to in what's developing in the European Union and the use of hazard-based criteria in the new renewal of crop protection products. So countries like Canada and other uh, like-minded countries or other like-minded countries typically base their MRLs uh, using risk-based criteria where you take factor in uh, the exposure of, of the, the pesticide residue when to salvage the MRL. When a hazard-based criteria is used, 
exposure is not accounted for. It just takes into account that hazard that it, ex that it presents. And it oftentimes, it, it represents a much more conservative estimate of the, of the hazard that it poses. So what we're seeing is with these conservative estimates is that crop protection products are being uh, removed or not renewed. And then two years later, the import tolerance for MRL is then taken away. This has an impact because uh, if the MRL is removed in an export country, such as the European Union, it restricts our use of that, that product here in Canada. Last but not least, the last thing that's really shifting, and this is becoming more, more prevalent, is the increased sensitivity to public attitudes towards pesticides. A prime example of this is just glyphosate. You know, the increased sensitivity and the scrutiny around this pesticide or any other pesticides that have a, a similar sensitivity is increasing, and this tends to limit our use or will have the impact to limit our use. So what are we doing? We know the trading environment is shifting. We know there's a problems with MRLs and, and non-tariff tariff trade barriers. What as an industry are we doing to try to stay ahead of this and ensure that Canadians have access to crop protection products and are able to export the crops that we produce? We look at this in, in three different ways. We look at uh, managing the risk of a non-compliance due to an MRL, uh, due to MRLs through short-term, medium-term, and long-term action. In the short term, what we try to do is ensure that there's no unacceptable level of trade risk. This happens through, through committees such as our, our Pulse Canada Market Access Committee, where we bring together the full value chain to ensure that the, prox the products that we're using don't create a trade risk in the short term. I'll, do, I'll describe this in more detail throughout the presentation. And then, and then the outcome of, of these meetings is communicating the risk through the Keep It Clean program. In the medium term, we would like to work to attain the required MRL if possible. So if there's a missing MRL in a certain country, we can work with the product registrant uh, here in Canada to supply a data package to that export country to establish an MRL. So this requires communication of the product registrant. However, it's not a very fast process. Usually this process takes two to three years. Therefore, again, it's a medium term action. In the long term, this is where we work. It's a more of a broader, multi-commodity, multi-country effort to advocate for the harmonization of MRLs through codex alimentarius, regulatory cooperation, trade agreements, etc. Basically, trying to get everyone singing from the same, same songbook to ensure that MRLs are harmonized and we don't have issues with missing or misaligned MRLs. This is led in Canada by the Canada Grains Council, working with other like-minded countries and organizations and coalitions to, to bring people together to advocate for this harmonization. So from now on, I'd like to talk to you about our Keep It Clean program and the kind of that short-term short -term look that we do to manage that risk of non-compliance. So the Keep It Clean program is a joint uh, initiative between the Canola Council of Canada, Pulse Canada, Shields Canada, the Barley Council of Canada, and Prairie Oak Growers Association, Association. The Keep It Clean program provides growers with resources for growing crops that meet the requirements of Canada's domestic and export customers this includes information on the use of crop protection products and agronomic practices to reduce market access risk. All this information is available on the website, uh, keepingitclean.ca. I should note as well that we do receive additional funding through the Canadian Agriculture Partnership uh, to help run this program. So what I want to do is I want to highlight uh, what we like to call the five simple tips in the Keep It Clean program. Essentially, everything that we do in the Keep the Clean program and all the resources that we present and talk about can be summarized within these five simple tips. So the five simple tips are tip number one, use acceptable, acceptable pesticides only. Tip number two, always read and follow the label. Tip number three, manage disease pressures. Tip number four, store your crop properly. And tip number five, deliver what you declare. Again, five simple tips that describe everything that we do in the Keep It Clean, Keep it Clean program. For the sake of this presentation and, the, and the, the tips that are associated with the use of crop protection products and MRLs, I just wanna focus on tip number one and tip number two to define what this looks like for, for the use of our products. So tip number one, use acceptable pesticides only. 
What this means is that only use pesticides that are both registered for use on your crop in Canada and won't create trade concerns. Now, as a farmer, this is probably difficult to know what products will not create trade concerns or what might be considered acceptable pesticides. You would think that products registered in Canada should be free to use and you shouldn't have to worry about whether it might create a trade concern. So how do you find all this information? What we like to do is, is encourage farmers to talk to their grain buyer to ensure that the products you're using are both acceptable to domestic and export customers and read the 2020 Pulse Summer Advisory that we produce every year. Grain buyers will have an indication of the market that you're shipping your crop into, thus knowing if there's a product that might create a trade concern. As an industry, we also produce a Pulse Summer Advisory to help communicate these risks and let growers know of the products that might create these trade concerns. So before we present our, Pulse 20, our 2020 Pulse Center Advisory, I just want to take a moment to help describe or help uh, give indication of how we determine market risk. So as I mentioned before in that short-term action, we have a Pulse Canada Market Access Committee, like other national commodity associations, so similar to, to canola and cereals, where we bring together the full value chain. So this includes uh, grower representation, members of grower organizations, staff at, at their national commodity stations, such as myself, we have representation from the product registrants or Crop Life Canada, a representation from the, the agri retailers, as well as representation from the, the grain buyers and exporters to make sure everyone around the table has a voice around the, uh, determining what that risk might be for crop protection products. Through this committee, we follow uh, a document that's, that's been developed by the Canada Grains Council titled the Market Acceptance of Pesticide Use Policy. Within this document, it outlines a framework of how to determine this risk. So things we look for and assess the market risk are we look at the markets of interest. So determine which markets uh, are, are most interest uh, to, to the crop type, so for pulses. So this is any market that we ship to that exceeds 5% of our production or exports or has a large monetary value associated with it. So otherwise it's an important market. Once we determine our markets, we determine our pesticides of interest. By doing this, we look at all the pesticides that might have had a, a label registration, are coming to, to the market or a new registration, or might have undergone uh, some type of change that, that warranted to be reviewed and run through this risk assessment process. Often what we're looking at for pesticides, pesticides of interest are more late season products. So for example, a seed treatment product has very, very low risk of providing a, a market risk, Therefore, we usually do not look at these. Again, we only look at products that have uh, are close to end of season or propose a market risk through detectable residues. Once we've determined our pesticides of interest, what we do is go through as a categorization process. Factors that we include through this categorization process is that we look at things such as the likelihood of a product leaving a detectable residue. Again, if the product does not leave a residue on the seed, it doesn't pose a market risk. There's nothing to test for, or there's nothing to find if you test for it. Therefore, it's not a product of concern. We look at the frequency and quantity of detectable residues. So for example, how often do we see residues on our, on our crops? And if we do see them, at what level do we see them consistently? We look at regular changes in export markets. So does something change in the export markets that might change what's been going on previously? And is it gonna increase our risk for, for a, a market access issue? We rely on industry intelligence and markets with sensitivities. So just give indication whether there's certain markets that are sensitive to certain products or different regulations. Other factors to consider are some things like pest pressures and product use patterns for the pesticide. So for example, if there's a pest pressure that's associated, let's say an insecticide, and it's associated with only with, with an outbreak in, uh, of that insect every two to three years. We know it's not going to pose a risk every year, so we need to be aware that if there's an increase in risk, uh, pest pressure, or that or potential for an increase in risk, what does that look like if that product was going to be used widespread versus minimally in a different year? Again, getting back to that use pattern, how often is that product used and when is it used? Another thing we look at is regional concentration of use. So for example, overall, we might look at a product and see that it's not really uh, used a whole lot countrywide. However, this still may pose a risk, uh, a market access risk, if this product was usually concentrated in a certain area. So say it's uh, focused on, on a small part of a province where there's a large potential of people in that area to use the product versus you know, not being used widely across the whole country. 
with that regional use, there's still potential for product to, uh, for grain to be concentrated in that area and exported and have a higher risk of detectable residue if it's concentrated in that area. So these are some of the factors that we considered when making our decisions. When we go through the categorization process, we end up with three different categorizations. We call it a red or a green, no recommendation, a yellow or amber, which means be informed, and then a red, which is a do not use. If you categorize a product as a green, no recommendation, this means that the risk of MRO related trade disruption is acceptable. You know, there's no concern to market access. There's a low likelihood of problematic residues at ports. MROs are established in most of our major markets, you know, and essentially the grain, if it's if the crop protection product is treated, is treated on your crop, all grain buyers will accept that product. This will, this will not be included on global advisories. If you look at the flip side of this and we look at to categorize a, a product as a red or a do not use, this means there is an elevated risk of MRL, MRL related trade disruption. That uh, risk is too great. Therefore, grain buyers will not accept the product that is treated uh, with that crop protection product if it's classified as a do not use. Product registrants will not commercialize this product if it's not brought to market in the past, or if it is, they will not sell the product if it's been classified as a red. And then growers are advised not to use this chemistry or crop use pattern as it poses too great of a risk. Now we have this be informed or yellow or amber category which fits in between the green and red. It's often reserved products where it's not clear. You know, some markets it may be acceptable, but there might be markets that are more, more sensitive and maybe it's not acceptable there. This is often referred to, to products or to crops that maybe are, are shipped a lot in a small lot shipment. By, by small lot, what we mean is it's containerized or rail car or has the potential within a small lot shipment to come from a single source, whether it's a single farm or single field, i.e. it doesn't go through that blending process like a bulk shipment. Anytime that we have a small lot shipment, it poses a greater risk to market access and detectable residues. As I said, it can come from a single farm. So if it comes from a single source and doesn't go through blending, then there's just a greater risk of having those extreme levels. So if it gets a yellow or yellow or bee informed category, what this means is that we're not saying not to use the product. What we're saying is that you need to talk to your buyer before using the product. You need to talk to your buyer to make sure that it's okay for them and the markets that they're shipping into. And if it's not, then that buyer can tell you whether or not they'll accept the use of that product. So here, uh, again, the primary chemistry copy battery can be commercialized. Green buyers may or may not accept the, the product. Again, you have to talk to your green buyer. So I want to talk about our Pulse MRO advisory. So here is the full document of our Pulse MRO advisory. And I really encourage you to, to look up this document after the presentation, and I'll summarize it again at the end. What this document provides is a brief overview of some of the market access issues and what we're dealing with and why this information is important. What we also provide is some of the risks associated with the products and things to look out for, tips and tools on how to mitigate this risk, but again, also this policy member advisory that provides indication or products of concern that growers should be aware about. So I want to take some time to really jump into this advisory and go through the products of concern that we're highlighting for 2020 and provide some information on why these products are appear on our advisory, just to give some indication of, of the thought process around how we classify these products and why you should be aware of them. So the products of concern that we've highlighted for this year are three active ingredients. For pre-harvest weed control, we have glyphosate on our advisory or pre-harvest glyphosate, and it's classified as a yellow or be informed for all pulse crops. For the desiccant products, what we have is two different active ingredients. So for diquat or regolin, it appears on our advisory as a yellow be informed for all pulse crops. This is due to a low MRL in the US, and I'll explain more about this in a bit. For glufosinate, we have a differentiation in registrations between Western and Eastern Canada that's important to note. For Western Canada, glufosinate is registered through generic product for use on lentils. New for 2020 is we are classifying this product as a red do not use. A red do not use means that there's an elevated risk of emerald related trade disruptions and treated grain will not be accepted by grain buyers. Again, we are advising farmers not to use this product on lentils this growing season. If you look at glufosate in Eastern Canada, we see that there's a registration on dry beans. We have classified this 
this project grew Fossi Tanisha Canada on dry beans as a yellow bean formed. Now I'm going to take some time to go through each one of these and provide a bit more information on why they have the classification that they have and some of the factors that contribute to this classification. So I'm going to start with our defecant products and starting with Diquat. So Diquat has appeared on advisory in the past and it remains unchanged for this year. Again, it appears as a yellow bean formed for all pulse crops. The main reason for this is the low US MRL. So if we look at the MRLs in this chart, we can see that if you look at Canada, the MRL is established at 0.9 ppm on all of our pulse crops, peas, lentils, chickpeas, dry beans, and faba beans. If you look at other major markets, and all, what I've highlighted here today is Codex, the Codex MRLs, the European Union MRLs, and the US MRLs. We can see that the Codex MRLs are fairly aligned with our Canada MRLs at 0.9 for peas, lentils, and chickpeas, and slightly lower at 0.4 ppm for dry beans and faba beans. If you look at the European Union MRLs, again, they're a bit lower than what we have in Canada, but still acceptable to us. 0.3 ppm for peas and chickpeas, 0.2 ppm for lentils, dry beans, and faba beans. What really stands out and why it has received the yellow classification is a low US MRL at 0.05 ppm. We view this as a potential for a trade risk or at least highlighting to, uh, to, to grain buyers and to growers yourself that this, U, that this low MRL does exist. Now, we're not saying you can't use this product. Again, what the yellow classification means is to talk to your buyer to make sure that they are okay that, uh, for using this product if the product is going to the US. If there's any type of blending or, or within a bulk shipment, likely little concern. In some cases too, there might be no concern in a small lot shipment, but again, it's up to the green buyer to determine if that's a risk level or not. So switching over to glufosinate ammonium now as a rather desiccant product, again, I wanna highlight the differentiations between the Western Canada and Eastern Canada registrations. In Western Canada, glufosinate is registered, has a use pattern on lentils, and is not registered on any other pulse crop. Again, we have classified the glufosinate ammonium as a red do not use on lentils in Western Canada for the 2020 growing season. What this means is that grain buyers will not accept this product and growers are advised not to use the product this growing season. The reason for this classification is mainly due to missing or misaligned MRLs in all of our major markets. If you look at lentils and glufosinate for Canada, we have a 6 ppm level for glufosinate. If you compare that to Codex in the United States, we do not have an MRL established in these markets. There is no MRL. So any detection of the product for a country that refers to Codex MRLs or for the US or shipping to the US, it will result in a non-compliance. This is a major risk. If you compare it to the EU as well, there's an MRL established. However, it's established at the level of detection of 0.03 ppm. This means that as if any product residue is detected, it will result in a non-compliance. The trade risk is too great for this product. That is why it's classified as the red do not use. And we really do recommend growers not to use this product this growing season. This product will also appear on the uh, declaration affidavit uh, for the Western Green Elevator Association members, so the large line companies. Therefore, if you're shipping lentils to these large companies, it will appear on the declaration and you'll be not allowed to use this product. Now, if we compare this to the, uh, the glufosinate registration in Eastern Canada, where the product is only registered on dry beans and no other pulse crops, if you look at the MRL tolerances for Canada and other countries, again, it's not too much different. For Canada, we have a, the level of set low at 0.1 ppm. If we compare this to Codex, the European Union, they're both at 0.05, low MRLs. If you look at the US, we do not have an MRL established. Again, this product does pose a market risk. However, it's classified as yellow, be informed, due to dry beans being mainly under production contracts. Buyers really have the ability to be upfront whether they'll accept the product or not. And there's differentiations between market classes and different countries that they're shipping to. Glufosate is an important product to be used for some dry bean market classes. And that is why it's remained as a yellow, be informed, rather a red, do not use. Again. If you're using that yellow, if you're using glufosate on dry beans, make sure you talk to your green buyer in Eastern Canada before you use this product. The final product I want to talk about that's on our pulse summer advisory is pre-harvest use of glyphosate. 
So glyphosate, uh, I guess to start off, I think glyphosate remains highly scrutinized both domestically and in the global marketplace. Glyphosate is, is categorized as yellow bean forms for all of our pulse crops. So again, what we're saying is not, we're not saying not to use this product. Yellow classification means talk to your grain buyer before you use the product. If you look at the emerald landscape for, for pulse crops, there's differentiation between different pulse crops in our export markets. I'm going to focus on peas and lentils to start, as we usually do not see, as we do not see a regulatory impediment to this product. Emeralds are established in Canada at 5 ppm for peas and 4 ppm for lentils. If you compare this to the Codex EU and US MRLs, they're either, either aligned at 5 ppm at Codex or they're set higher in the EU, such as 10 ppm or 8 ppm in the US. Anytime you have an MRL that's established at a higher level than what is in Canada, it really does not pose a marketing risk, as the MRL should be within the Canadian MRLs. However, it appears as yellow advisory due to scrutiny in the global marketplace. We do know of grain buyers and the market signals are saying that some people do not want this product or do not want product that has been treated with pre-harvest glyphosate. That is a marketing risk and is being communicated as through this advisory. Therefore, we encourage you to talk to your grain buyer before using this product. If you compare this to chickpeas, dry beans, and salad beans, we do see some regulatory impediments as far as MRLs and exports in, in some of our major markets. For chickpeas, uh, MRLs is established at 5 ppm in Canada. However, and if you look at fab beans as well at 4 ppm, we do not have a codex MRL established for these crops. Codex MRLs are used uh, by a majority of our, our export countries. Uh, this is a really important MRL, and the lack of uh, an MRL at codex really is a marketing risk. Therefore, that's why it's yellow. Be informed. Talk to your green bar. If it's going to one of these countries, they can let you know if, if you can use this product or not. If you look at dry beans for pre-harvest glyphosate, uh, we see that the MRL is actually a bit lower in most of our export markets. Dry beans is set at 4 ppm for Canada. It's only at 2 ppm for Codex in the European Union. Again, about half of our MRL. That being said, I want to highlight that within the dry bean industry, we have already seen a shift away from pre-harvest glyphosate uh, that's been brought on by the buyers. Especially in Ontario, we've received indication that the majority of buyers, if not all buyers in Ontario, do not accept pre-harvest glyphosate on dry beans anymore. Therefore, regardless of MRL situational landscape, the buyers are making that restriction. And again, you need to talk to your buyer to see if it's acceptable or not. So that was tip number one. Always re or use acceptable pesticides only. The next tip I want to highlight is, is what we uh, call tip number two. Always read and follow the label. So follow the label for application rate, timing, and pre-harvest interval to ensure residues in the treated products will not exceed the MRL. Again, the maximum residue limit is set based on label directions. So we all, you have to follow the label to make sure that it's applied, the crop protection product is applied based on those label directions to make sure it does not exceed the MRL. For pre-harvest interval, sometimes refer, referred to as the PHI, this is the minimum number of days that must pass between the last application of a pesticide and when swapping or street cutting of the crop. I want to make the, the differentiation here that it's, it's not harvest, it's cutting of the crop. So if you look at the figure here, we can see that it's from the time of spraying to cutting. So that's either swathing or direct combining. If you swath your crop and let it sit and then combine it, that period between swathing and combining does not contribute to the PHI. Again, it's at the timing of, timing of swathing or cutting. So what I want to highlight here is a tool that we have on the Keep It Clean website or available at spraytoswath.ca. It's, it's what we call the spray to swath interval calculator. If you're curious of what a PHI or pre harvest interval is for crop protection product, for canola and pulse crops, you can go to this tool and easily look up the PHI for that product. You can do this in two different ways. The first way is to use the calculator to select the crop type that you're, you're most interested about, and then using the drop down list, select the product that you're inquiring about. Within this, if the product is there, it'll tell you what the PHI is easily and give you any indication as far as restrictions or things to consider associated with that product. Another thing you can do with this calculator is, is trying to find a product that maybe fits your timeline. So say you know you have seven days before you'd like to harvest a crop or harvest your crop, but maybe you're looking for desiccant options or another pesticide option. 
You can use a calculator also to choose your crop type, choose a, a product so such as, you know, in this case, that's being shown as insecticide, and set, your, set the time that you want to, to catch your crop. So you're looking for products with anything less than a seven day PHI. This will provide you all options that are available to you for that crop. Again, a handy calculator available at the Keep It Clean website or spraytheswath.ca. Now, the final things I want to talk to you about in this presentation is, is the pre-RVC glyphosate for weed control. So this fits within the PRC of glyphosate for weed control fits into the tip number two. Uh, always read and follow the label um, just to make sure that the product is used according to label directions. So I want to highlight here that glyphosate is registered for pre-harvest perennial weed control and is not to be used as a desiccant. Again, it's meant for pre-harvest weed control. It's not meant to dry down the crop. Pre-harvest glyphosate should only be applied when seed moisture content is less than 30% in the least mature part of the field. This is key. We know it's been shown very well that that 30% moisture content is a cutoff to when we see MRLs being exceeded in any crop. So what does 30% moisture content look like? I'd say this is a greater challenge because the label directions and what we keep saying with 30% moisture content is not what farmers associate with, with when to apply the product. We always look for visual characteristics. We don't have a good way to quickly tell what 30% moisture, moisture is. So within this, this resource, uh, keepyclean.ca slash glyphosate, we have a pre-harvest glyphosate staging guide. Within the staging guide, we provide the visual characteristics associated with the use of PRS glyphosate that appears on the glyphosate label and also that's accepted by industry. So as I said, 30% moisture content, the best connections that we have is visual characteristics. Now this guide does not provide a very detailed uh, visual experience, however we do provide the visual descriptions associated with it. So for example, Chickpeas, the visual description for 30% moisture content is the plants are yellow to the mature pods, seeds have changed color and attach themselves from the pods, and pods rattle when shaken. Dry beans, 80 to 90% of the leaves have dropped and pod color change uh, to mature color is 80%. The upper pods are yellow and seed rattle in the lowest pods. The seeds of the dry beans have lost the green color when split. So if we split the seeds open, no green will remain. For fava beans, the leaves are drying down and stems are green to brown in color. The lower pods are dark brown to black. Lentils, 80% of the plant is yellow to brown. Seeds from the top third of the plant are fully formed and firm. Seeds from the bottom third are hard to tan. Pods rattle and shaken. And finally for peas, most pods, about 80%, are yellow to golden brown. Seeds in the bottom pods are attached and rattle in the pond. Rattle in the pod. Again, these are visual characteristics that are helped to, to determine when the pre-harvest glyphosate should, can be applied if it is allowed by buyers. We should note that when applying pre-harvest glyphosate, you must also apply it uh, when 30% moisture content is in the least mature part of the field. It's really important to assess the full field when timing pre-harvest glyphosate application, um, as if there's areas of the field that are above that 30% moisture content, we will see the chance that residues will exceed the maximum residue limit. Now, if you're looking for a more descriptive kind of visual characteristics or how to help stage your, your, your pulse crops for pre glyphosate application, I really want you to refer to, to the grower group organizations and some of the resources that they might have. The example is this is for, for lentils on the Saskatchewan Pulse Corps website, where they provide a, a kind of a desiccation or pre-harvest uh, glyphosate staging guide and trying to time that, that application more, uh, much better. So there's more descriptions as far as visual characteristics and pictures, and also the visual descriptions of what to look for. Again, I refer you to, to the Saskatchewan Pulse Corps website uh, for this information. We also see similar uh, information on the Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers website through the Field P Maturity Guide, Fabric Bean Growth Staging Guide, and also Fabric Bean Staging on the Fast Pulse website as well. Again, these grower groups provide the information, uh, the more detailed information to help get this right for your area. If you have any questions around the staging of pulse crops for PR with application or what to look at content, please refer to these stages or reach out to the grower organizations uh, for, for help with timing this application. So to wrap up this presentation, I just wanna bring us back to the Pulse Summer Advisory. Again, I really encourage everyone that's uh, tuning into this webinar to go find this document 
at the keepingitclean.ca website and really read what's into it. Everything I've talked about today will be summarized in some aspect in this document, whether it's the background on the market access issues and why this is a challenge, what the risks are associated with the crop protection products, information on the use of pre harvest application of glyphosate, what you can do uh, to mitigate this risk, and the pulse of advisory itself. To wrap up the presentation, I really just want to highlight uh, what you can do as a grower to help mitigate this risk. So what you can do to ensure the product residues remain acceptable for both domestic and export customers is by following these tips. Again, tip number one, use acceptable pesticides only. Only apply pesticides that are both registered for use on your crop in Canada and won't create trade concerns. You can do this by consulting your grain buyer to ensure the products you're using are acceptable to them and refer to the pulse summer advisory uh, chart within this document. The second thing you do is always read and follow the label. Always read the label for proper application rate, timing, and pre-harvest interval. Again, maximum residue limits are set based on following label directions. Therefore, it's extremely important in a legal obligation to follow the label requirements. So with that, I'd like to see Sherry Lynn if there's any questions at this point. Um, my contact information is here, whether it's my office or email, please give me a call if you have any questions about this, reach out. Um, I'm happy to talk about this and provide any more clarity uh, where needed. Thanks, Greg. Um, that was great information that you shared with us today. Um, we'll now open it up for some questions. So those in the audience, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the question box. That is part of the GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, one question that, that I have, uh, Greg, for you is for growers that are shipping smaller volumes and have used products in the yellow category, so likely like kind of containerized shipments or bulk bags, do you think it's advisable for them to get their grain tested prior to selling if they've been used, if they have used one of the products? Could knowing the residue limits determine a what markets that they can sell into and and b just give them that confidence that what they are providing falls within our legal obligation yeah that's that's a great question Shailen. um i'd say you know there are options for gores to test their product for for residues there's many different uh, private labs that offer this as a uh, fee for service. And if you are curious about what your residue levels are, or maybe you're questioning if you're getting the timing correct or not, you can reach out to some of these private labs or reach out to myself and I can help you connect to some of these private labs to get that testing done. However, if you're applying the product according to label directions and you've had that conversation up front with your buyer on the use of the product and if it's acceptable to them, then no, I don't think at that time it's, it's worth uh, testing all of your product. Again, it's only if you have that, if you want that indication, if that, if you want to know what your uh, residues are. But again, if you apply the according to the level of direction, have that conversation with the buyer, then no, I don't think you need to be testing your, your product all the time. What is, do you know what approximately the cost is for having the testing done? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I don't have the numbers off, off, off hand, but there are differences in, in methodologies and testing. So it could range from anywhere from possibly under hundred dollars to, to two or three hundred dollars if you're looking at a, a glyphosate test. So ballpark, again, don't quote me on those, but uh, that just gives you an idea of uh, potentially what it might cost. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, at this time, I don't have any other questions. Okay. So you've done a great job in, in terms of addressing our interest in this topic. Um, if there are questions that people do have after the event, um, please contact Greg and, and he can answer them directly. Just a reminder for CCAs, an email will be sent out to you that you will be able to reply with your number so that you can get your credit. At that time, you can also provide suggestions for future webinar topics and any feedback or suggestions that you would like to send our way. Thank you again, Greg, for sharing all your knowledge on protecting market access for pulses and the information available on the Keep It Clean website, as well as the resources that are available on the different Pulse websites. A big thank you to Andrea for organizing the session today, and an even bigger thank you to all our participants for joining us, and I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you.